let's pause now and step back and do the hard work. It really is hard work of seeing chapters one through three whole and how the larger paragraphs and chapters fit together to make one main point. Father, I ask as we attempt this flyover or this attempt to see the forest, not just the trees of words and phrases and clauses, that you would give us illumination and help us to put the pieces together in the way you intended. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to read these slides very quickly because I know that you can pause any time and think and and test what you're seeing, and I encourage you to do that. Ephesians 1, 1 to 14. The ultimate aim of all God's planning and acting is the praise of the glory of the grace of God, or simply the praise of his glory. 1, 6, 1, 12, 1, 14. Can't miss it. The aim is made absolutely sure by its eternal roots in the purpose of his will, which gives rise to his choosing, election, and predestining, and redeeming with Christ's blood, and adopting, and sealing, and bringing to an inheritance appraising people. So it is sure And it is to the praise of God's glory, because it's eternally planned. Now he prays. Paul follows this weighty doctrinal section with a prayer for the Ephesians. And what he asks is not that God cause them to do anything, but rather that God would make them able to know through the illumined eyes of their hearts. One the hope of his calling. Two, the glory of his inheritance. Three, the greatness of his power in them who believe. And then the rest of the prayer is designed to show how great that power is, since it's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at God's right hand and put all things under his feet. A prayer that we would know the greatness and the glory that he's just been describing in the doctrinal section. Chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Since the ultimate purpose of chapter 1 was that the Ephesians and we might praise the glory of God's grace because we know God's eternal plan of undeserved election, predestination, redemption, inheritance, all of it undeserved. Therefore, since that's the goal, in 2, 1 to 10, Paul underlines the hopelessness of our spiritually dead condition and the sovereign work. So the hopelessness and the sovereign work of grace in making us alive and creating us as his workmanship, not ours. And the aim of this emphasis on our hopelessness in His sovereign grace, to make us new creatures who believe and do new works. The aim is to eliminate all boasting and to thrill us with the hope of eternal ages of enjoyment of God's gracious kindness. Ephesians 2, 1 to, uh, 2 11 to 22. In these verses, Paul restates the same hopeless condition of non-Jewish peoples and the same sovereign salvation that we saw in 2, 1 to 3, only here he recasts the salvation not as dead people being made alive, as in 2, 5, but as alienated non-Jews being made true Jews in Christ. So this was personal, this is corporate description of the same glorious, gracious, sovereign salvation. You are no longer strangers and aliens, you Gentiles, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, members of the household of God. This salvation happened by the blood of Christ as both Jew and Gentile, 
were reconciled to God through the cross. In other words, none of this was your own doing. This reconciliation of Jew and Gentile and both to God was the sovereign work of God in Christ. Then, Ephesians 3, 1 to 13, Paul moves toward a second major prayer, just like in 1, 15 to 22, but he pauses with a kind of interlude to restate the mystery of Gentile inclusion in the saved remnant. He says, for example, the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. We've seen that before in 2, 11 to 22, but he says it here in 3, 6. Only now, here's the reason for a repetition, only now he relates the revelation of this mystery directly to his role as an apostle for the Gentiles. If they read this, if they read his words, they can have insight into the mystery of Christ so that his work on their behalf and their inclusion in the church as full fellow heirs results in the manifold wisdom of God being shown in the church to all the powers of evil. 310. And therefore, here's the point of this interlude. Don't let my imprisonment discourage you. It's for your glory. That was the point of these verses of interruption. And now, Finally, he gets to his closing prayer in these three chapters, which is like the prayer he saw in 115. Now Paul restarts his prayer, where he had broken off in 3.1, just as in the first prayer, Paul does not ask God to cause the Ephesians to do anything. That's going to come later in chapter 4, 5, and 6, but rather to know God's hope and inheritance and power, just like he did that in verses 15 to 23 of chapter 1. So here, he prays not that they would do anything, but that they would know what surpasses knowledge. That's an unusual knowing. Namely, the breadth and length and height and depth of the love of Christ, which he had just seen in the cross and the blood that reconciled Jew and Gentile. In this way, they would be filled with all the fullness of God. If you're full of the knowledge of the love of God, you're full of God. And then he ends the first three chapters of Ephesians by returning to the ultimate purpose of the book. To God be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. So let me put it together. In verses 1, 1 to 14, To God be glory for eternally planned and performed grace. And I pray that you would see that glory. That's chapter 1. I present you with the glory of grace. I root it in eternity. I show you how it will be performed by sovereign grace. And now I'm begging God, oh, give them eyes to see it. And then in chapters 2, 1 to 10, Grace secures joy eternally and excludes boasting in rescuing the hopeless. So he's underlining the glory of grace by pointing out our deadness and hopelessness and God's sovereign grace in saving us. And then he does the very same thing in 11, only this is personal. Every one of us personally was dead in trespasses and needed to be made alive. And this is corporate. There is Gentile corporateness and Jewish corporateness, and they are cut off from each other. And this verse says, no, they're not anymore. Through Christ's blood, Gentiles are united to God and to Israel. And then. He is uh, about to pray again, like he did here, doctrine, then prayer. And here it's doctrine and then prayer, only he interrupts briefly to say, my apostleship 
because he says he's in prison and he thinks that's going to really discourage some of these people. My apostleship is for God's glory in the church. Take heart. The very fact that I'm imprisoned is working for your glory. And then he prays like he did here. You get these two prayers. And both prayers don't ask God to cause us to do anything. They ask that we would see, that we would know with a knowing that surpasses knowing. So, in other words, this is, these are some of the most heavy doctrinal chapters in the Bible. That right, right there. I should have not included that right there. And this right here. Those are heavy doctrinal sections. And Paul teaches us to pray. And that's the way we should preach. We should preach this kind of doctrine, preach this kind of doctrine, and our people should hear us crying out for them. Oh, grant our people eyes to see. Because most people don't. You preach to them this kind of doctrine, they go home and watch videos. They say ho-hum, they yawn. But oh, God opens the eyes of some and they're staggered. Their mouth drops. Their lives are never the same again. And Paul knew that. He knew that. Without prayer, people aren't going to see. And without prayer, people aren't going to know the love of Christ. All to the glory of God. Now we're ready, I pray, for chapters 4 through 5 and 6.